Today, we'll hear from Rafaela Crevoche, an expert in compost, regenerative agriculture, and sustainable soil management. This is the second of hopefully many webinars for which she will be joining us. Please welcome back Rafaela Crevoche. I'll stop sharing so you can start. Okay. Let's see. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome. It's great to have so many people here today. And thank you, Emma. Uh, we're going to talk about environmental pest management. Uh, I understand that this is on the minds of many of the gardeners here. And uh, I, I hope to introduce our protocol for small gardens, whether it's a, a conventional small garden or a raised bed small garden, it's uh, the, the protocol applies equally. Yeah, um, okay. Environmental pest management, what is it? Well, it emerges out of IPM, in integ uh, Integrated Pest Management, which emerged as an approach to best pest management in the early 70s. Um, IPM was a revolutionary uh, procedure. It, it uh, let go of the industrial pesticides that had been current in agriculture at that time. And instead opted for a, an integrated program of, of uh, processes and procedures. Now this was all set off by Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which uh, basically discredited the, uh, the industrial pesticide market. Uh, and uh, uh, that led directly to the, uh, to, to IPM being established. Now, IPM for all of that's good about it, still uses industrial pesticides. EPM, environmental pest, environmental pest management, does not. And now EPM is inspired by the work of an organization called Beyond Pesticides. And uh, they, uh, they report that uh, uh, the IPM protocols out there have been co-opted by some uh, major uh, agricultural agrochemical uh, companies and their collaborators. So uh, EPM cleans up that, it removes that from our system. Uh, and EPM has been fortified by the proliferation of biopesticides in recent times and I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, here's a little glossary that might be helpful as we go through this. Some of these terms may not be familiar. Uh, if they are, well, great. Uh, but uh, I tried to include some of the key words that we've used. Cultivar is very important. It's just a cultivated variety of plant. If it, you have a uh, an Othello tomato, well, that's a cultivar. Uh, the F1 hybrid, it's just it just the uh, refers to those plants that have been crossbred in the first generation. Uh, heirloom, uh, I think everybody knows what heirlooms are. They're they're heritage cultivars. Heterosis, that's a new word. Uh, it refers to hybrid vigor, which is produced in uh, the breeding process. OMRI. OMRI is the Organic Management Review Institute, and that's the go-to reference. 
if we have any doubts about the integrity of a product, uh, just uh, go to Omri and see if it's see if it's approved. And if it has the label on it, you can count on that. Then open pollinated are uh, flowers fertilized by by uh, insects, uh, birds, wind, rain, etc. Uh, they're not part of the, an intentional breeding process. A pathogen is a microorganism, or it could be not so micro, it could be a macroorganism that causes or can cause a disease. And then uh, one of the most important terms is soil organic matter, and we call that SOM. And that refers to debris that uh, originates from any living thing. Wait a second. Let's see. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Uh, so now these are the key uh, key points that I want to talk about uh, when, as we get in, in, into a review of environmental pest management. Now, what this program is, is uh, it's an array of disciplines. Some are maybe more important than others, but they all work together to make your pest management job easier. So, uh, okay, uh, now the traditional way or the, the, the 20th century way of dealing with pests has been the silver bullet approach, just to spray it with something and deal with it that way. And there's still a tendency for a lot of us uh, to, uh, approach it this way. I've gotten several letters this week for uh, questions from growers uh, asking for just that. They want to know they have a certain pest, they identified it, they want to know what can I do to get rid of this pest. That's not going to be our approach. That That is, that's kind of the old school method. This is an integrated uh, procedure that uh, involves various uh, pro, uh, 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 various inputs uh, to uh, uh, give us a good handle on pest management. This will not uh, exterminate all pests. It won't. You'll still have a few around, but they'll be manageable and, they, and you won't sustain serious or, or, or significant crop damage. So first of all on the list, we've got biodiversity. Um, and we're going to go through each of these individually. Second is genetic selection. Yes, you're going to be gen geneticists, even if you don't have a PhD in the topic. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a job that you can do. Then there's, there's the old standby visual inspection and manual removal. It doesn't work for everything, but it works for a number of, of, of the larger bugs that get involved in, in, the, in our gardens. Then there's biopesticides and biofungicides. This may be new to some of you. Uh, this has been really a, a great innovation. There were always some of these around, but nowadays they are, this industry is exploding. And it seems like every month there's another uh, item on the market Sanitation of cutting cutting tools, that's a kind of a basic uh, uh, fu function. Uh, cover crops in your planting rotation. Now this is something that uh, that I, I strongly recommend. Now cover crops have traditionally been the domain of farms and big commercial operations. But uh, we can use it to our advantage in, in, uh, in the home garden and uh, get lots of benefits from it. And uh, a, a key benefit is the disruption of disease cycles. Then there's pest exclusion, and that can be done. Uh, there's the, there's a, uh, something called floating row covers that are available everywhere nowadays. And that can just keep pests out of the garden, and that's uh, often a very uh, appropriate measure to take. And then there's encouraging beneficials. And there's so many beneficials out there. So many insects, butterflies, birds, bats, owls, hummingbirds, 
uh, it's it's worthwhile to make the effort to to welcome them into your garden. Now, uh, in terms of biodiversity, this has become a big buzzword uh, nowadays. Uh, but, but here's our uh, here's an illustration of it. Uh, the lower photo shows mono, a monocrop, and it looks healthy, it looks good, and you can get away with it often, but uh, uh, we recommend a biodiversity planting with multiple herbs and flowers among your vegetables. Now, you could do that uh, on a kind of a minimalist basis, or you could really mix it up as this, this photo shows. Uh, either way, you will get lots of benefits. You will re reduce the disease pressure. You'll balance out the nutri nutrition in the soil. And you can get a good crop out of it. If you have enough garden space, you can just spread that, uh, that lettuce around and you'll, you'll get it. It'll just be in different places. So we recommend uh, with your vegetables to always plant at least some herbs and some flowers. Now there's the 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 uh, the, the 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 pattern that you use is up to you. You can be creative. This is an opportunity to uh, uh, fashion your own canvas your way. But it's important to have those herbs and flowers in there because uh, as you learn about herbs and flowers, you'll discover that many herbs and many flowers either repel or attract insect pests. Either way, it's a plus. It'll keep it off your tomatoes and off your cabbage and off your, your, uh, your squash. Now there are some rules to, uh, I, I shouldn't say rules, There's a, there are some guidelines to planting biodiversity. First of all, uh, biodiversity discourages disease and soil nutrient imbalance. Well, I, I just uh, kind of uh, indicated that. Now, uh, you should always plant a different species, a different kind of cultivar altogether in a previously occupied spot. So if you had uh, tomatoes, don't plant tomatoes again in the same place. If you had broccoli, don't plant more broccoli again in the same place. Plant something else. Plant, plant a, uh, plant, just plant another vegetable, plant a flower or plant an herbs. And uh, this is uh, one area where cover crops really helps. Uh, kind of uh, clears the air. You're just giving the whole, whole uh, garden a rest by planting a cover crop and uh, uh, changing the, the, uh, the, the purpose and the diversity of the garden accordingly. Here we are with genetics. Now, uh, it's really pretty simple. Uh, there has been an explosion in the plant breeding world since the, the uh, mid 20th century. And there are new, new uh, uh, hybrid seeds available every year. And many of them have concentrated on producing plants that are immune or at least resistant to most of the diseases that infest our garden. So you can, you can open any seed catalog and go through it and you'll see uh, the descriptions that uh, you know th uh, this this uh, 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 hybrid variety uh, resists plant uh, disease X, Y, or Z. Some of those are regional and you may not need them. Some of them are just what you're looking for. Now, even in those cases, that's not a silver bullet, but it gives you a leg up in, in resisting diseases. Another thing that you get out of hybrid seeds is what they call hybrid vigor or heterosis that we just saw in the glossary. Uh, and that, that produces plants that are robust and more robust than, than the norm. So that's another leg up 
in the uh, uh, disease resistant uh, uh, menu. Now you can, uh, having said all that, you can use heirloom tomatoes, uh, excuse me, tomatoes, <laughs> excuse me, heirlooms. Uh, I've got heirloom tomatoes on my mind for, for a specific reason, but it's okay to use them. Uh, just be aware, they don't have the resistance that these hybrids have. And uh, you, you should expect to take extra care. You can grow them. And they're they're fine. They're 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 uh, they're consistent with the program overall. But just give them a little bit extra attention. Now here's the old standby: a visual inspection and manual removal of plant pests. This is pretty important. Uh, it's very basic. There's no uh, no secrets involved in it. But you just it's something that needs to be done. You should go out in your garden at least a couple of days a week and, and look for these things. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, uh, I've had the experience of, of, of looking and looking and not seeing anything and all of a sudden discovering a big fat tomato hornworm and it's enormous and you have to take, it really is best removed by hand and it, it's, uh, it can be a shock uh, to see it. But uh, it's only because you are looking and you just have to keep looking until you find these things. And that's, that's an important uh, factor in this uh, overall discipline. Now, biopesticides. This is a, uh, a, a, a growing business. It's, there's, there's tremendous variety of biopesticides coming out uh there are they're they're all typically organic certified omri approved uh, they're based on isolating certain microbes and that that have the properties that uh, uh resist or destroy pests or something like that and uh uh, they're 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 commonly available. Uh, you can get them online. You can get them uh, at every garden store. Now they they can act in various ways. It's interesting uh, because they don't just necessarily attack diseases. It depends on the unique properties of of each. Uh, uh, isolated uh, organism. Uh, for one thing, they can outcompete with diseases for nutrients. That's an interesting way to approach it, but it works. Others uh, will produce substances that inhibit disease development. That's more of the traditional uh, approach. And then others make the host plants more resistant to the pathogen. And finally, there are others that attack the pathogen directly. And they can be used as uh, uh, foliar sprays or soil drenches. Now here's an example of a very successful bio, uh, biological pesticide. It's Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis. Now this was discovered uh, in the early 20th century. It was isolated from dead silkworm larvae. I don't know who was researching dead silkworm larvae, but they came up with this one. And it, uh, it's very effective in damaging the intestines or the, the, what it passes for intestines of insect larvae. Uh, it's toxic to moths, uh, beetles, nematodes, flies, you can use it as a foliar spray. It's only effective for a day or two, but it is very effective. It's the go-to uh, treatment for uh, for cabbage worms. Just uh, just spray it on any brassica, whether it's cabbage or collards or or cauliflower or broccoli. It it uh, does the job. 
a more recent iteration of uh, uh, bio biopesticides is spinosad. Now, spinosad was discovered in the uh, in the 1980s in an abandoned rum facility in the Caribbean. You know, I I don't know what how these researchers are finding their locales. Uh, but one uh, sourced it from a silkworm, the other was in a rum distillery. But uh, it got the job done and uh, it isolated this bacteria, Saccharopolyspora spinosa. This is a very powerful, very effective uh, uh, spray, but um, it's no less harmful to humans. It's fine. It's, it's very uh, toxic and lethal to many, many insects. Uh, there's a warning that comes with it. Uh, it, it, it if it's wet, uh, if, a, if, a, if wet spinosad just sprayed on a plant will harm bees. So you need to wait until dusk to, to use it. But this, this uh, product has been so effective that it has been co-opted by mainstream agriculture. It is used in all kinds of situations in commercial agriculture now, because it, it works. And it's kind of a harbinger of things to come in the, in the uh, insecticide industry. You can use it as a foliar spray. And uh, of course it is OMRI approved. Now here are some examples of uh, biopesticides and how different they can be. And this is a drop in the bucket. There are so many of these out there. I can't keep track, I can barely keep track of them. And uh, it, you, can, you can keep learning. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, infinite uh, opportunities to, to school yourself about uh, biopesticides. But these are a few of the examples. There's Bacillus subtilis, which is very widely used. And it uh, it uh, treats a number of of uh, foliar diseases. Uh, Trichoderma harzianum works on soil-borne pathogens like Fusarium, Rhizoctonia, Pythium. Renutria saccharinensis stimulates stimulates plant vigor and plant resistance, so it's got a different pathway of action. It's quite different from the others that are just outright going after the uh, organisms. Um, Burkholder, Burkholderia is toxic uh, to insects. And uh, this one uh, is very interesting, Bacillus amyloloquifaciens. It colonizes the plant's roots and outcompetes the pathogens while nourishing the roots. That's an interesting twist. So we've got uh, lots of options, lots of very good options, getting better all the time, and uh, basically displacing the, uh, uh, the industrial pesticides of, of, of the past that are still around, but uh, uh, the uh, biopesticides are, are taking the uh, initiative. And by the way, what, one of the, the uh, factors that militates against industrial fertilizers uh, is that it, it, takes, um, it takes eight to 10 years to, uh, to uh, secure approval by the appropriate agencies for these sort of things. And it takes a lot of money, a huge amount of money. Whereas biopesticides uh, don't, need much time to be approved and they they do require some money to support the research but it's not not even comparable to the to the other one so i think it's safe to say that this is the direction that agriculture is heading whether it's commercial agriculture or backyard agriculture now here are some pesticides that are uh, commonly used uh, i've only listed a few um, we don't have time to go through them all. This again is a, an exhaustive list, but uh, maybe everybody's favorite is neem oil. And neem is from the 
the Indian tree uh, called it, well, it's called the neem tree, Azadirata Indica, which means the, uh, the free tree of India. And this is uh, used for a very broad range. And it seems that like every time I, I look into neem, they're adding another pest or another problem that it treats. So it's a kind of an all purpose thing. It's super safe to use the oil and uh, and uh, uh, also other parts of the tree are, are used in uh, all kinds of products that, that are safe for humans. It's in soap, it's in toothpaste, it's uh, it's really it's just great. I can't believe that it exists like this, but this is a pesticide that that is uh, it's good for the body too, at least for the human body. And then uh, this is a kind of an old standby pyrethrum. It's been around a long time since the early 20th century. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, derived from the chrysanthemum, and it has the insect's nervous system, and it's it's pretty effective, and it could be part of a program. Now, as we go through these pesticides, it's worth mentioning that we don't recommend just one or the other. Uh, I mentioned spinosads being very effective, yes, but it's not uh, it's not appropriate to rely on spinosad. You might even reserve that for for difficult situations, but with all of them, it's good to use them uh, in in tandem, not in combination. But uh, you know, you could use neem once or twice a week, pyrethrum once a week, uh, use uh, spinosad occasionally, and then there are a few other things that you can use as well that don't have the same. Uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, treatment protocols. And here's one of them. This is diatomaceous earth. And this is something that you apply to the soil surface and it kills emerging in insects. So they, they try to crawl up through it and they get shredded and they're done. So there, <laughs> there's an interesting option. And another, uh, very popular uh, uh, application is uh, soap, and uh, it's it's so simple. It's easy to to make. You can make it at, at home easy, or you can buy it readily, ready to use. It kills uh, soft-bodied insects, and it won't harm uh, hard bodies like lady ladybugs. Um, this is this this can be. Uh, a, a, a major part of your uh, pe overall pesticide program. Uh, and it's, of course, super safe. And then there's uh, vermicompost. And I have to add this. Uh, I am a tremendous advocate of vermicompost for, um, for a lot of reasons. But it turns out that one of the reasons is that compost has been proven to su suppress some soil-borne pathogens. This is amazing, but uh, the research has been done and there is more research to come on other, others, uh, other pests, other pathogens, and I expect we're going to hear a lot of positive things about this in the future. Now we come to cover crops. Well, cover crops. There's a lot of benefits to cover crops. First of all, they, it disrupts soil-borne and foliage-borne disease cycles. And the way you, you disrupt the cycle is you'll take your bed and you decide, okay, now's the time. We've had some crops in here. We've had maybe some diseases and some pests. We're going to clean it up. The cover crop can, can really kind of wipe the, the slate clean. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll plant the cover crop and that cycle of, uh, of, of the cover crop will interrupt uh, any disease cycles that, that have been, or, or pretty much any disease cycles that have been uh, getting rooted in your soil. 
uh, it also contributes mightily to soil organic matter. And that's, that's often the most uh, used or the most cited reason for using cover crops. But uh, and, and it, you know, it, uh, it improves the soil structure, it enhances carbon sequestration, those are all great things. But individual cover crops have unique properties. Mustard, that's a great, it's a great cover crop. You can actually eat, eat it too if you, if you want, or if you, you can save the seeds and press the oil. But that's not our purpose at all. Mustard is a natural soil biofumigant. So it's actually going to neutralize pathogens that are in the soil. Buckwheat is great. Great crop, and it just attracts bees like you you never imagined you had so many bees around. The cover crop radish, which is kind of like a daikon, it's a big long thing, and it can open up compacted soil, and that's a great uh, benefit for for many gardens. Then there are uh, the legumes, cow peas and vetch are a couple of them that add nitrogen to the soil. So you plant that and you, your not, soil is charged up with nitrogen uh, for the following season. Now, uh, not, not, in any case, I'm not recommending using just one. You could use any combination of these and there are dozens of others and each has its unique properties. Uh, and uh, it's, it's worth learning about and they're worth using. It's, it's kind of a renewal of health for your garden when you do it. And so I recommend planting at least one bed, one raised bed or partial bed or a container to cover crops every year. So you could get a rotation of about every third year or fourth year. Uh, and depending on when you live, you, you, where you live, uh, if you have a short season, that'll, that may take up most of the season. If you have a year round season, you can, uh, just take advantage of it uh, during that part of the year that, that you choose, but make it part of your regular rotation. And here is the cover crop uh, uh, schematic uh, showing all the things it can do. And, uh, you know, with all of these things, and we'll get to this in a minute, uh, it's not just for managing the pests. They have other benefits too, and there's plenty of benefits to cover crops. So uh, please uh, take note. Then there's the uh, sanitation. Well, this is pretty obvious, but the the, the key here is that uh, you know, and sanitation in general is is a possible positive thing, keeping your garden clean, keeping your tools as clean as possible. But it's this is intended for situations where you're using tools to cut soft tissue, so soft plant tissue, because that is the most vulnerable to infection. So just, uh, you know, use an alcohol dip before you cut, uh, do it every time. So not every time you cut, but every day that you cut so that you can minimize the spread of, of, uh, of those pathogens. <clears throat> The floating row covers are a great innovation. They've become pretty popular. Uh, everybody can use them. And they just keep pests out. And uh, they may be, in some cases, the most critical, the most important procedure that you'll use in your garden. Uh, and it's non-invasive. It's just, it's just a good thing, good thing to uh, take into consideration. Then there's an, uh, encouraging beneficials. You know, they, these are bugs like ladybugs, uh, beneficial nematodes, praying mantis, lace wings, and there's many, many others that are lesser known, that are quite effective, and maybe just the thing for uh, for your garden. Uh, as you as you look into these, as you research them and look at the products. They will tell you what uh, pest they can target, 
what, what they're effective on, whether it's aphids or thrips or whatever. And there are many, this is another exploding area where there's uh, an availability of a plethora of these and more being introduced all the time. So uh, be sure to make this part of your garden protocol. Uh, and if you don't already have them in your gardens, get some. Make sure you have at least ladybugs. And uh, the beneficial nematodes are very effective as well. And we have birds. Well, you know, birds are uh, they are part of the ecosystem now. There's a reason we call this transformative gardening. And the reason is this. The traditional approach to gardening is to plant rows of the same crop, harvest them, get a crop, and good night, you've done your job. Okay, nothing really wrong with that. But what we're doing by, <coughs> by applying all of these various procedures and uh, materials, is we're actually creating your own miniature ecosystem in your backyard. It's much more than the traditional model. It's very rich. And birds are part of it. You know, to, to have a garden without, I can't even imagine a garden without abundant hummingbirds and other birds, and uh, not to mention owls and bats, uh, in your local gardens. Now, here are some figures uh, about uh, uh, what these uh, uh, critters can do. Hummingbirds eat up to a thousand insects in a day. I, you know, I, I didn't even realize that, but because, uh, you know, I use hummingbird feeders and I thought, well, all I eat is sugar water, you know, but that's not true. They're, they're, they have a diversified diet and they play a role in this. Bats, approximately 4,500 insects every night. My God. Now, bat shelters can be purchased or built uh, on a do it yourself basis. And then, barn owls eat, uh, they, this is a, a predator of, of a different uh, critter. They, they eat, you know, rodents and rats and that sort of thing. And that's important in your garden too. Now, uh, I'm not suggesting that an individual gardener should set up an owl nest, though it's it's a pretty straightforward process. But this is the sort of thing, and it applies to the bat situation too, that can be done on a uh, cooperative basis in a neighborhood. If you have other gardeners who are, who are your neighbors, you could get together, put up a bat, a bat house or a, an owl house, and they're really beautiful, by the way. The uh, owl, the barn owls are wonderful animals. They're they're very docile, and except with regard to to those rodents, and uh, you you'll all get the benefit of them. So uh, that's something else to to take into consideration. So I like I said, you know these these. Um, these procedures are at least certainly in concert with one another uh, will lighten your load in terms of pest management, make it much easier uh, and uh, it, it'll allow you to, 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 to concentrate on the things that you want to in your garden once you make these just habitual. But they also do other, uh, they also contribute other important uh, factors to the, to the life of the garden. So uh, uh, it, it just kind of underlines the way that all this is interlinked. Pest control is linked to uh, soil health and soil maintenance. And uh, um, uh, genetic selection uh, uh, brings a lot of resilience and robustness to the plants. Um, you, you know, uh, encouraging beneficials 
contributes mightily to the establishment of a mini ecosystem in your garden. Uh, Macroorganism, the, the uh, system's macroorganism diversity is enhanced by encouraging bird life. And floating row covers don't just exclude pests, they uh, protect crops from heavy rain and from sunburn damage. So uh, this all has to be looked at as a package. Uh, there are a few silver bullets out there. There are, there are some, for example, some biopesticides that absolutely are very effective against certain pests. But overall, this is, this is our, our recommendation for managing pests in your garden. But I want to give a special thanks to Estelle Carroll of the Deep Roots Project. She's in Chicago uh, for, for her help with the graphics and the illustrations on this project. Estelle, thank you very much. And uh, everybody can reach me. Here's my contact information if you wish to uh, uh, if you have a, a, any question that, uh, or if you want to go into to any topic deeper and it's not covered in the Q&A session that's coming up, uh, you uh, please please contact me at, at that uh, address and I'll, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And thanks everybody, thanks very much. Uh, this is uh, uh, this has been great. Uh, I hope. Uh, I hope everyone has learned something from this. I certainly have. So uh, let's move on to the Q&A session. You got it. Thank you, Rafaela. You're welcome. Um, we got like a thousand questions, so I suspect we won't get through them all, but uh, we can get through as many as we can. Um, on the note of cover crops, um, Beth H was wondering if you can plant directly among the cover crops. You can, you can. Um, I want to ask, and now I want to follow it up with my own question. What do you have in mind to, to plant? Uh, but uh, in general, the purpose of the cover crops is to kind of clear the chalkboard and uh, start afresh. So you're you're kind of militating against that by planting something else in there. Yeah, you can do it, uh, but uh, think it through thoroughly before you do so. Um, Ruth K asks, when do you put up row covers so that the plants are still accessible to pollinators? Is... Oh, that's a that's a good point. Uh, yeah, there may not be suitable for every plant, but uh, basically you you can put the row covers up when the plants are are transplanted in there or when they come up. And when they as they start to flower, you'll have to remove the flow, row covers to allow access. Okay. Um, many, many folks had questions about uh, voles and other vermin getting into their gardens. Do you have suggestions for those types of pests? Well, I like bat. I like owls in uh, in particular. Owls. Uh, they they are uh, they they are very uh, popular in commercial agriculture. This is something that's maybe not well known, but they're being used everywhere in the world. Everywhere. Uh, so uh, I know that that's kind of out of reach of, of, of the individual gardener, and that's why I suggested uh, looking into cooperating with your neighbors on it, because uh, 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 an owl house um, is, going to, is going to consume uh, the, those rodents in a much greater area than your garden. They'll, they'll, they'll cover a few square miles. So you don't need much for the whole thing, but uh, somebody needs to, to to step up to do it. Other than other than that, uh, there are there are a lot of uh, there are some 
uh, recommendations for uh, uh, for repelling these these animals. Um, urine is is a popular old school remedy, but I, I, I never seen that be very effective. So uh, I, I, I would I would stick with the owl recommendation. I know that's not going to be satisfying to a lot of people. But uh, we've also tried the kitty litter suggestion, and that also did not have a great effect. Right, right. That's the ur it's basically urine. Yeah. yeah. Um, Teresa M. and many others have concerns regarding the frequency of use of biopesticides in relation to killing non-pest insect species. Do you have a comment on that? Well, you're worried about killing beneficials. Um, it's always a risk. Uh, it's, it's, uh, but it's, uh, in my experience, it hasn't been a big issue. I have not seen. Um, I've not seen the uh, uh, major suppression of beneficials uh, through uh, through the use of, uh, of biopesticides. And if you're selective with your biopesticides, uh, you can avoid damage to the beneficial population. Okay. Uh, back to the owls quickly. Do you have a suggestion for how to attract said owls other than putting up an owl house? Well, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm no expert. If you're not that. an owl expert, that's okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'd like to be because I, I, I really, I'm really kind of very enthralled by the whole thing. But what I understand is if you build it, they will come. They'll find it. And if not owls, then kestrels, which are a similar, they pre, they're a similar predator. They, you know, they're different birds, but uh, they would also live in the owl house. Okay. Uh, Catherine S. asks, if you use a pesticide like uh, spinosad, will it harm the beneficial insects as well as the pests? Well, that, that's kind of the same uh, 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 question that we just had. Um, it could, I mean, certainly we know that there's a warning on spinosad that mm -hmm. you, uh, the, that wet, when it's on wet, it will hurt beads. And that's probably the, the primary uh, concern of everybody is not to interfere with bees. So, uh, there's a protocol in using it and it has to be used in the evening, uh, when the bees are, are down and it gives it a chance to dry out before the morning. Uh, other than that, uh, it, it seems to be pretty safe and, and uh, very effective. All right. Um, when you, a bit of a clarifying question here, when you spoke about biodiversity and plant rotation, did you mean to imply that uh, perennials should also be rotated. No, the perennials are a different, they're, they're, it's a different thing altogether. Mm -hmm. And in general, uh, I don't find it very practical to put, to have perennials and annuals in the same guard, uh, produce garden bed. So uh, I would put my asparagus and strawberries and, and blueberries and blackberries in their own place. Uh, that said, you can still plant for biodiversity. You can still plant around the edges and in the spaces, uh, flowers and herbs, and that, that'll help the crop and help the soil. But uh, uh, no, uh, we're not going to, we're not going to rotate uh, perennials, not at all. All right. The, the, Next series of questions I have for you are about specific pests. Uh, so Eugene D would like to know if there are any solutions other than hand picking for Asiatic garden beetles and European red lily beetles. Yes, there are. <laughs> there is. Uh, I'm. I am been informed that um, there are 
you know, with all of these uh, uh, biopesticides, there's there's off they're they're often coming up with new strains that that have uh, specific applications, and I understand that there's a new strain of BT Bacillus thuringiensis that is very effective against Asiatic beetles. Uh, I don't have any personal experience with that, but it's certainly worth a try, and it could uh, minimize your problem. All right. Olivia lives in Massachusetts and has an organic garden that suffers from tiny black flea beetles. They come out in the spring and are voracious and eat the bok choy and eggplant and other veggies. How does one control them without using harmful chemicals? Yeah, I, I'm wondering what does she mean about harmful chemicals? Uh, is she oh, that just... was my language. Olivia wrote pesticides, but... Oh, okay. Well, even that. Uh, is she referring to to the industrial uh, chemical pesticides? Or maybe I'm wondering if she's aware of all of the biological options. That's mm -hmm. that's what I, I wish she were here. I could ask her that, you know, but I think uh, this is important, an important point, because there are a number of biologicals that could be effective, certainly in the early stages, in the larval stage. If, if you got them at that point uh, with um, BT, it could be it could be very effective. It's it's it just there's a number of unanswered questions there that uh, and I invite I'm sorry I didn't get her name. Olivier. Olivia. Pardon me. Olivier's. Olivia. Yeah, I I'd I'd, I'd be happy to to uh, to hear from her and and we could. We could have a conversation about it. Okay. Uh, Olivia, if you're on, feel free to email Rafaela. Um, just a note to everybody who's on, uh, we're approaching the top of the hour. If you need to leave, go ahead. Uh, of course, you'll receive the recording and see, be able to see anything you missed. Um, and I would like to know our next webinar will be February 9th with the authors of the book called The Climate Change Garden. Uh, so I hope you all can join us for that and be on the lookout for an email about that. Um, all right. Dale lives in the Pacific Northwest in a forested area and every year their house gets overrun with box elder beetles. Dale has tried water and vacuuming and none of this has worked and um, do you do you have any suggestions for what Dale can do again avoiding pesticides? I imagine you have the same questions that you had for Olivier. Yeah, I, I do have the same questions, and I I I, I need to uh, issue a disclaimer. I, I I'm not very familiar with uh, structure the with the pesticide control of structural interiors. I'm not sure what is the best approach for that. Uh, but you can use some of these uh, uh, materials that I, I recommended. Um, the question is where you where you spray it and do you find them living uh, where you seek them or do they disappear and uh, there's there's a lot of a lot of issues there. so I can't get much more specific than that. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Carol Lisa M wonders what to do about tomato pests such as rusty leaves. Well, th this is uh, th this is bacterial rust. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly you're. It's either bacterial or fungal, and uh, uh, we we there are uh, treatments for that. Um, where does she live, by the way? Carolisa did not tell me that. She didn't tell you. Okay. Uh, the reason I'm asking is if she lives in the humid east, that's probably a factor in the spread of, of that sort of disease. And it would be important to uh, prune the plant and make sure that uh, there's, there's not a lot of uh, foliage impinging on the plant's integrity so that the plant has a lot of 
air circulation, that will lessen the probability of inf infection. All right. Uh, Susan H. asks whether samurai wasps would be a good method for managing stink bugs. And if so, are samurai they wasps. for purchase? Samurai wasps, I'm, I'm not familiar with them. But if they are recommended to use that way, there is uh, inevitably a basis for it. And uh, I, I, it's definitely worth a try. There are so many species uh, that are that are really that act as beneficials against so many species of of, of pests, uh, and it's difficult to keep track of it all. But uh, uh, this is part of your job in researching this is is to identify what works against what, and if you have a a solid recommendation to use it, do try it. And let's find out if it works. Uh, Linda N. asks about whether there is a soil-friendly way, actually many people had this question, uh, whether there's a soil-friendly way to discourage slugs, and especially those slugs eating some tender seedlings. Diatomaceous earth, have they tried that? I don't know, I can't ask Linda, but okay. it's a good suggestion. Uh, that, that'll be my, my best shot at that. Okay. Uh, Holly T shared that jumping worms have decimated her garden, weakening plant and shrub root structures, killing several and stressing others so they won't flower. Do you have any tips for getting those under control? I would use BT for, for any worms. Try it. See if, see if you can uh, minimize it. All right. Oh, and I see some folks in the chat are saying ducks love to eat slugs. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I should have mentioned ducks in the program. That's a good point. Because if you're able to have ducks or chickens, but ducks are even better, uh, in uh, wandering around your gardens, they just, they only help. Yeah. All right. We just have a, a few more here. Uh, Judy W. says her biggest challenge is cabbage worms, not just the green ones, but the cross-striped ones as well, which are harder to see and handpick. Um, and she says that they came up from the south to Ohio due to climate change. Do you have suggestions for how to deal with those pesky cabbage worms? BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's it's, I've had great luck with it, great experiences with it over the years. Um, you'll just have to uh, uh, determine on your own how, uh, the frequency of the application, but uh, it, it, it'll pretty much minimize whatever cabbage worm problem is existing at the, at, in your location. Uh, Frank F. asks about squash vine borers and mildew. Squash vine borers, yeah. Uh, I discovered uh, a, uh, a, a, a non-chemical, non-biological, non-invasive non way. Uh, the squash borers seem to uh, infest the young plants as they're just growing up. And uh, you can obstruct their ingress by taking a paper cup, cutting out the bottom, and putting it over the, the plant so the plant is protected. You know, bury that cup of, uh, an inch or two in the ground. And that, that brings success. Now, I'm not saying 100% success, but um, definitely worth doing. All right. Um, David, I'm going to answer you directly now. Uh, if you registered for this webinar, everyone will get a recording of the webinar a lot and a, lot, a PDF of the presentation. And you're welcome to share that with whomever. Um, all right. Alex Z was wondering about leaf miners and aphids on citrus. 
Well, aphids, uh, aphids are very vulnerable to ladybugs. Mm. Leaf miners, uh, I would start with neem oil and uh, graduate in the direction of spinosad if that's not very effective. Okay. And finally, Mark I asks, how does one remove jumping worms without removing native earthworms? Well, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Worms are typically very vulnerable to BT, and I would try that first. I, I haven't seen BT damage earthworms at all. I haven't seen it. And I'm not sure that there's uh, a relationship, um, uh, you know, a kind of a locational relationship between jumping worms and earthworms. But uh, I'd certainly start with BT and, and see where we go from there or if we need to go anywhere from there. All right. Raffaella, I believe we've done it for today. Great. Um, if you have more questions, you're... Well, first of all, thank you to the 216 of you who stayed on past four o'clock. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank you. Uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out. And... Uh, and we'll say goodbye for today. Thank you, Rafaela. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us.